welcome. Good to see you guys again. We are, can you believe that we are in the first week of June already? Today is June the 2nd. Fact check, true. Okay, I was worried for a second there. June the 2nd. Seasons are changing, right? Right, be- right before our eyes, springtime is turning into summertime. Uh, my garden is already a mess, so we're right on schedule as far as that goes. Um, but in this season, in this kind of season between spring and summer, you guys, many of you know, we talked about the grads uh, last week. It's a season of change out there too, right? It's, it's the end of, of a season for many people. It's, it's the, the end of the school year. We have graduations to go to, colleges. Kids are letting out from school. My kids got about, uh, I think this is their last week, right? So, so we're, we have one more week to go. I think uh, my brother's kids have two more weeks to go, but it's getting there, right? We're in a season of change, both in the seasons outside and in life. And uh, as the seasons change, like my family and I, we've been going through a little bit of a season. Uh, the school year is almost over. Personally, I can't wait because we get up in the morning every morning and we're, we're packing lunches. I'm there packing lunches and making breakfast and stuff from, uh, with my wife or our two little girls. And I cannot wait selfishly to not have to get up in the morning and pack lunches and all that. Uh, and it's kind of funny because we're getting to the end of the year, end of the school year, and our, our school nurse uh, reached out recently, maybe maybe with a, a month left to go in the school year. And we're thinking, oh man, we're, we're out of the, the winter time. All those sicknesses and all that stuff is left behind. <laughs> Foolish. And then of course, the, the nurse uh, reaches out with an email and it's to the whole school. And she's like, well, we have strep throat. Uh, we have hand, foot and mouth disease. We have stomach flu, pink eye, head lice, COVID and rabies. <laughs> And then my kids came home like two days later right on cue with strep throat, stomach flu, pink eye, and rabies, wouldn't you know? <laughs> but it was it's stressful, right? With, with one month to go kind of right at that finish line, I wasn't thinking any of that stuff was, was still uh, going on or was going to come back with a force like that. But yeah, with one month left to go, both the kids came home and they're like alternating sick. I don't know what they do. And they're, they maybe go to their rooms and they kind of sneeze in each other's faces, whatever gross thing that they do to keep it going in the house. But it was going in the house for several weeks. Even dad got sick. And all you wives out there, you know that when the husband gets sick, it's... <laughs> so I was sick for like, for like three weeks with a sore throat. Yeah, I'm a big baby. I'm sorry. My, <laughs> Andrea, my wife, knows very well. But sometimes when you go through seasons of life and you go through like a season like that, a season of maybe hardship and difficulty and you're listening to your kids cough themselves to sleep at night and uh, it's, it's, it's tough. I'm sure you guys have gone through seasons like that in your life and, and I find myself and, I, and my wife and I sometimes have found ourselves saying, what have we done to deserve this? Like, like why are we going through a season like this? Why, why does it seem like it, it's us? Why does it seem like this kind of keeps happening? Maybe, maybe, maybe you've been through a season before where you felt like you just can't catch a break. Or maybe the break that you're catching feels like it might be you breaking. So today, what we're going to talk about in this, in this You Asked For It series, this was another one that was very popular. It's kind of the God why question. Why God? And there's a lot of questions that we ask of God. Uh, you know, you got, you got the who's and that. You got the what's. That, that's probably popular when we're asking God what. What about this? What about that? You got the where's and the when's. And maybe when is pretty popular. God, when is this going to happen? God, when is that going to happen? So you got the who, the what, the when, the where. But the most, I think, common question that's been asked throughout history of God has got to be why. Why, God? Why? Why am I going through this? Why is suffering something that happens in the world? Why, God, does it feel like, like sometimes when it's, when it's happening to me, it's like it's not just raining, but it's pouring, right? Why, God? Why? I don't know if you've been there, but I, I do believe that that is probably the most asked question of God. So today we're talking about why do bad things happen? Why do bad things happen? So I want to start with, an, with a popular opinion. I've heard this out in the world, and I've heard this in the church many times over the years. And, I, and maybe I've actually uh, believed the, the lie a little bit sometimes myself. But I would say a popular opinion is that if things are going bad for me, if things are going bad for me, it must mean that God himself is bad or mad at me. If things are going bad for me, that must mean that God himself is bad or mad at me. So 
what kind of God lets stuff like this happen, right? What kind of God allows suffering in the world? You've probably heard that before, right? I've heard that before. I see that in comments online and stuff. And, and uh, another question is, you know, if this stuff, it seems to keep happening to me, is God, is God mad at me? And I've heard many times over the years as a pastor, people coming and, and talking about season they're going through, and they've been like, is, is, am I doing something wrong? Is God, is God mad at me? Is that why I'm going through this stuff? So today we're going to deal with, with, with this, this question, why? Why, God? And I think it's, I think it's a natural thought. It's kind of earthly wisdom. It's maybe not heavenly wisdom, but it's an earthly wisdom. But in the moment, it makes sense. If things are going bad for me, maybe that means that God is mad at me. And, you know, you know sometimes when it rains, it pours, and the pressure mounts, and situations can get compounded and more and more complicated, and maybe it feels like you're being singled out. Uh, the temptation can be to look at your neighbors and say, how come this doesn't happen to them? How come, how come they're not going through financial struggles right now? How come, how come they're not going through a messy family situation right now? How come they got the nice house? They got the fancy car. How come their social media is full of all these pictures of them and these beautiful vacation destinations, but we're barely pulling it together. We can barely pay our bills. Maybe, why aren't they the ones that got sick? Why aren't they the ones that were born a certain way? How come I'm the one that was born with a condition or a disability, has been going through a season, and they seem like they've been fine? How come them, they're doing well, but not me? Why, God, why? Asking yourself, how come they can have kids? They don't even seem to want them. How come... How come they, when they sell their house, they sell for high price and then they buy for low, but it seems like it's the opposite for us. It seems like we're always a little bit late to the party. We're always a little bit late to the deal. We're always a little bit off. And maybe worse yet, you're praying about all this stuff and nothing seems to change. Why me, God? Why me? I remember my my daughter was about five years old and I forget what it was exactly. I don't know if she was going through, through strep throat or one of the, the many things that school sometimes gives these kids. But we're praying about it. We're praying about it every night. And, and I think we prayed about it for like three nights. And I'm sitting there talking to my girl. She's in bed, you know, and we're, and we're praying. And after we're done praying, my little five-year-old says, Daddy, why do we pray if God doesn't answer? Right? And she's five years old. And, I, and I'm a pastor. And I was ill-prepared for that question. I was like, uh, because his grace is sufficient for us? She's like, Daddy, what does that mean? <laughs> I was caught off guard. So why? Why do bad things happen? And you maybe heard this story. I, I heard this, I've heard this a couple times over the years. I forget when the last time I heard it was. But uh, there's this idea that, that maybe, say there's a storm coming, it's a tornado coming, and, and two believers, two believing, praying believers are in that town, and they have houses, they have a place where they're living in, in that town. One's on one side of the town, the other's on the other side of the town, and they're both praying to the same God, the same prayer that the tornado would pass over their house. And wouldn't you know it, the tornado passes over one of their houses and it wrecks the other person's house. But they were both believers and they were both praying. Why? Why me, God? And the funny thing is that Jesus dealt with this several times in Scripture. This is not like temptations and thoughts and questions that are, that are just for our generation. Like people actually came to Jesus and asked questions very similar to this. We're going to see it here in Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13, uh, we'll pick it up in verse 1 there. About this time, Jesus was informed that Pilate, he was the governor, had murdered some people from Galilee as they were offering sacrifices at the temple. So these people are from Galilee, and they were murdered offering sacrifices at the temple. They were Jews. And if you know your Bible a little bit, you know in the Bible, it, it kind of talks trash about Galilee and people from Galilee. There's actually a famous scripture that says, like, can anything good come from Galilee? So, so they're asking Jesus, they're saying, hey, did you hear about these Galilean Jews who were murdered by Pilate while they were offering sacrifices at the temple? And Jesus discerns the heart of this question. And he says, do you think that those Galileans, verse 2, were worse sinners than any of the other people from Galilee? 
Do you think that God singled out those particular people who were murdered because of something that they had done? Were they, were they such sinners that that's what happened to them? Can we look at somebody's situation and say, you are experiencing this because you're a sinner and you're getting what you deserve? Now, maybe that's a little bit different than, than how we think today sometimes, but that was a prevalent attitude back in Jesus' day. Even among the, the religious leaders, they really thought that if you were going through something, if you were suffering, if you were, if you were disabled or something, like that must mean that you were full of sin or God was mad at you and you were getting what you low-key deserve. And Jesus is like, do you really think that they're worse sinners, these guys who were murdered, than all the other people from Galilee? Jesus asks, is that why they suffered? He says, not at all. Verse 3, and he turns it right back on the people that are asking the question. He says, not at all. And you will perish too unless you repent of your sins and turn to God. Now, I want you to see what he's doing here because the people come to talk to him and they're saying, hey, um, did you hear about these like, kind of loser Galilean people who are murdered in the temple? Yeah. Do you think that they deserved it? And Jesus turns it right back on them. Not at all. And you too will perish unless you repent of your sins and turn to God. They're looking down their noses at people that they think are less than them. And Jesus puts it right back on their hearts. He says, it's not about them, it's about you, and what are you going to do? And in fact, Jesus ramps it up a little bit in verse number four. He says, well, what about these 18 people who died when the tower of Siloam fell on them? Siloam fell on them. Were they the worst sinners in Jerusalem? So Siloam was a, was, a, was a good place. It was known for this pool that was like a healing pool. It was a, it was a, it was a place where you would go swim. It was a place where it was like a nice place in Jerusalem. And Jesus is countering their original question about the Galilean kind of losers that maybe did something to deserve what they received. And Jesus turns around and says, well, what about these winners that are you guys? from Jerusalem, and they were building a tower, and 18 people died when this tower fell on them. Were they the worst sinners in all of Jerusalem? He says, no, of course not. And I tell you again that unless you repent, you will perish too. Jesus says that emphatically twice. Twice. They are not any worse sinners than you or me without Jesus. And unless you repent, you will perish too. They're talking about a tragedy of losers from a bad place. Jesus counters about a tragedy of winners from a good place. But it says, guess what? At the end of the day, it's not about those people or those people. It's about you and your heart. Because we're all talking about tragedy. And yes, the people murdered in the temple, the people from Galilee, that was a tragedy. And yes, the people who died right there in Jerusalem in this good place, they were the good Jews. When the tower fell on, that's a tragedy as well. But you know what the real tragedy is? The real tragedy is that without Christ, we are all sinners headed for tragedy. He tries to tell the people to look inward. It's not about what's happening to those people over there. It's not about especially bad sinners go through especially bad things. This isn't about karma. This is about something deeper than that. Without Christ, we are all sinners heading for tragedy. Tragedy befell both. It didn't matter where they were from. It didn't discriminate based on the people, who they were, where they were from. And Jesus says, you know what the bigger tragedy is? It's right at your door. Accept the offer from Jesus himself. Ultimately, there are some bad things. Bad stuff happens in life. That's life, right? That's life. It's actually baked into life. And I'm not speaking death over us. I'm not, I'm not disbelieving in the power of prayer. I believe, I have seen in my life God's faithfulness and the power of prayer and his resurrection power even in my life because I was straight up, I should have been dead so many times. God's grace. 
I've seen and heard people who went through serious illnesses and God reached and did something in their lives and healed them. I'm talking about cancers and things like that. God has an amazing power to heal. It is who he is. He is life itself. The Bible says God is life and God is light. I want to make that very clear as I'm going forward here in this message. But ultimately, we are born into these kind of frail human bodies. And as everyone who's ever spent any time here on earth knows, these human bodies wear out by nature. They don't last. So ultimately, there are bad things that happen in life. It's called life. It's what it means to live inside of perishable human bodies. So which one is the bigger tragedy, Jesus is saying? He's saying, is the bigger tragedy to perish on earth, which we all will do one day eventually, or is the bigger tragedy to perish in the next life? So let's go back to Siloam for a second. Let's go back to that, that town in Jerusalem, that town that was uh, known as being a, a good town there. And it's interesting because it's only mentioned really twice in the New Testament, and they're in different books, but there's a thematic thread that ties them together for some reason. And we're going we're gonna to kind of pull on that thread today because it has to deal with the same topic that we're speaking about. So John 9 is dealing with the idea of sin, and did this person do something to deserve what they have experienced so it's about a blind man, a man who's born blind. John chapter 9, verse 1. As Jesus is going along, he saw a man blind from birth. His own disciples ask him, his own disciples, Rabbi, who sinned? They're just assuming that there was sin involved in this guy's being born blind. Who sinned? His, the man or his parents that he was born blind. Even his disciples didn't get it. Verse 3, Jesus responds, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so that the works of God, I want you to hear this, this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. This man was born blind. This man didn't know the Lord. This man was born blind. This man had never seen the light of day. This man has been led by his hand every single place that he has ever gone. He doesn't know what the face of his mother looks like. He doesn't know what the face of his father looks like. He was actually probably led by his hand and placed at the gates of the temple or some other place where crowds were going by. And he sat there and waited in the darkness for people to just come by and feel bad for him and give him some money so he could continue to exist. That is the kind of life that this guy has had. He's never seen the light. He's never seen the light. And I want to keep both of the meanings of never seen the light in our eyes as we go forward here. He's never seen the light, not the light of day and not the light of Christ. Now that last verse said, it happened so the works of God might be displayed in him. And what does that mean to a man who's never seen the light, who was born blind, who has been suffering his entire life? I have a friend who works, who works in the, the corrections field. He deals with a lot of prisoners. And he deals with a lot of prisoners with big time. They're dealing with big time. These are gang members. These are violent offenders. And my friend who works in the correction system, he's actually a believer and he has had a chance from time to time to, to experience God's grace and God's light, even piercing, even into the deepest pit where some of these guys are from, where some of these guys are maybe serving life sentences. They've done terrible things. But that light of God is strong enough and the grace of God is great enough that even his word can reach people in the deepest pits. Even if it's a dungeon, God's light can still shine. So God is perfectly capable of moving in our difficulty. His spirit hovers over the darkness. Remember from Genesis, his spirit hovers over. It's there. There's grace even in the midst, even in the most horrible of places. And this guy was born blind, condemned to a life of being a beggar. 
relying on others to lead him by the hand and feel bad for him and provide for his every need. Remember, Jesus said, neither sin, not this man, not his parents, neither sin, but check this out, because Jesus is about to bring the light both physically and spiritually into this man who is in darkness, both physical and spiritual. John 9, 6. Jesus does something gross. He picks up some mud off the ground, some dirt. He picks up some dirt off the ground and starts spitting in it and mixing it with his hands. Thank God that guy is blind. He couldn't see what was happening. (laughs) He spits in the ground, made some mud with his saliva. Can we go back to that one? Yep, made some mud with the saliva and he put it on the man's eyes. Imagine being that blind guy just for a second. Your eyes are closed. You're full of expectation. And all of a sudden, some guy is doing something, and he starts putting something in your eyes. You don't know what it is. He's putting something into your eyes. And he just tells him, go, verse 7, wash in the pool of Siloam. That means sent, by the way. Kind of ironic that Jesus is about to send this man to a pool called sent. So the man goes as he was sent, and he washes his eyes. And as he washes his eyes out from this mud that Jesus himself has made, he washes it off. What what do you think that feels like in the moment? You can't open your eyes in that part, right? You can't open your eyes because you get something in your eyes. That's still going to hurt this guy. Getting stuff in your eyes is terrible. So he goes blind to the water that he's been sent to by this man. And he goes into the water and he starts washing away this mud from his eyes. And I'm sure at first it's imperfect. I'm sure at first it's just a little bit of light. Maybe a blurry little bit of light. And maybe all of a sudden he starts washing out a little bit faster and a little bit faster. What is he seeing? What is he experiencing in that moment? And this crazy hope and this crazy joy is like rising up in this man as his eyes are open for the first time to see the light of day. The man went and he washed and he came home seeing. Verse number eight, this becomes a sensation His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging ask, is this the same guy? Is this the same guy? Because he used to sit here every day and beg, but now he's walking around telling everybody that he can see. And when we ask him what happened, he says, this guy healed him. It becomes such a sensation that the religious leaders, the Pharisees, they take him in for questioning. So what happened? How did this happen to you? Were you really born blind? Yeah, And a guy came and he put blood on my eyes and he sent me to this water and I came back seeing. The Pharisees are like, huh? The Pharisees get mad at him. So they they go and they ask his parents, was this guy really born blind? They're like, yeah, he was really born blind. That's our son. What happened to him? We don't know what happened to him. You have to ask him. They were scared. They didn't want to mention Jesus. So they bring the blind guy, the formerly blind guy back in. Give glory to God. We know that Jesus is a sinner. How were you healed? Give glory to God. And in verse 32, they call Jesus a sinner. Give glory to God. And this is his response. He says, nobody, verse 32, nobody has ever heard, this is the beggar, the blind beggar saying this, no one has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man, Jesus, were a sinner, if he was not from God, he could not do anything. And to this, the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day say, who are you to teach us about who's a sinner and who's not a sinner? You know who you're talking to right now? You know how many years up on this stage I've been preaching? Do you understand my closeness with God? And you, a loser from the streets, you were blind as a beggar eating trash out the gutter. You're going to tell me? You're going to tell us? You're going to lecture us. You were steeped in sin at birth. Either it was your parents or it was you, but you got what you deserved because you must have done something to deserve the blindness that you experienced and that suffering. It must have been you or your parents. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. There was an amazing miracle, an amazing move of God, an amazing grace of God that happened in their midst. And still people were blind 
and could not see. Do you understand? At the end of the day, these guys weren't so much believing in God. They were believing in karma or something. This guy got what he deserved. He got what he deserved. He was blind because something he did something that caused him to be blind, or his, his parents did something that caused him to be blind. He really just deserves to go through what he's been going through. They believe that bad things only happen to those who secretly deserved it. But true karma, the actually get what you deserve kind of karma, that's definitely not what any one of us wants. Because the wages of sin is death. That's what the Bible says. The wages of sin is death, and sin is rampant in this world. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and the wages, the penalty of sin is death. And Jesus is saying the tragedy ain't over there. The tragedy is not over there. The tragedy is gonna be right here. You are on a burning ship sinking into the ocean and God himself is saying, give me your hand. This whole thing's going down. Give me your hand. I'm here for you. I'm here to rescue you. I'm here to save you from this burning, sinking ship that is the world in its current form, my hand is here. Do you see the nail scars? What's the bigger tragedy, to perish in this life or to perish in the next? So that popular opinion, if things are going bad for me, it must mean that God is mad at me. I, when I look at this blind man, who can now see, when I look at the, the, the issues and the suffering and the difficulty and the trials that many people I know have passed through and, and maybe that I've passed through myself in my life, I think that the real unpopular opinion that's actually true is that the problems of today are fertilizer for the promise of tomorrow. What's going on in your life today, you can overcome by trusting in God that he's in control and will bring you one way or the other, into a better tomorrow. Whatever happens here, whatever the problem, whatever the hardship, whatever the trial, and you might say, well, Pastor Randy, you don't know what I've been through. You don't know about my trials. I've really been through it. And maybe I don't know. Maybe I don't know. I feel for you. But I know someone who does know, and it's a guy in the Bible, his name is Job. He lost everything. He lost his children. He lost all of his, he lost his house. He lost his finances. He lost everything basically but his life, his property, his family, his friends. He lost his health. His own friends to him, friends came to him. His own friends came to him and said, bro, you need to repent because obviously you're doing something wrong for God to be punishing you and singling you out to go through all this suffering that you've been going through. You must be sinning, Job. I was his closest friends. Even his own wife, Job's own wife says, your life stinks so bad, Job. You must have done something and God must be mad at you. She tells him, curse God and die. That's his wife telling him that. Just curse God and die already. Job who didn't understand what he was going through, didn't understand what was going on, didn't understand why he was experiencing all the things that he was experiencing. First his friends turn on him, now his wife turns on him, just curse God and die, Job. And Job responds to her and says, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. What kind of faith is that? When he didn't understand and when his foot was about to slip, when everybody around him seemed to be trying to push him over the edge, he's like, maybe I don't understand, but though he slay me, whatever happens, I'm just still trusting. I'm still trusting that God is good. He still entrusted his hands. He still entrusted his life into the hands of the one who knit him together in his mother's womb. So my wife grew up, uh, this is going to be a tough one. My wife grew up in Colombia, 
And uh, she's a pastor's kid. And I tell this story. I tell a lot of stories about Colombia, mostly because I, I, I make a fool out of myself every time I go there trying to speak Spanish. <laughs> Shout-outs to the gringos. Uh, so... But uh, my wife was a pastor's kid growing up in Colombia, so she was, she was uh, the children's pastor for, for many years down there. And this is like in Bogota, Colombia. This is, this, is, this is like the hood, right? This is serious. This is, this is kids who are like st- almost street level. In fact, there's ministries to kids who live on the streets down there. And my wife interned at a ministry that worked with street kids. But in her home church, she was kind of the children's pastor, and she was going out into the neighborhoods, and she was kind of evangelizing all these kids and running Sunday school programs for these kids with food and different resources for for really at-risk children and their families. And the kids would come week after week after week. There was like hundreds of kids at this tiny little church, but the kids' ministry was huge. And then my wife had many kids throughout the years who were like special little kids and, and they were like little helpers and stuff. And eventually, after several years of, of doing that, she moved to the United States and she met this guy and we got married and, and all this. But she always had in her heart all these kids that, that were from her past and from, from Columbia. She always remembered them, would pray for them and stuff. And uh, there was this, this kid in particular, this, this guy, many years had passed and, and he, was, he was on that verge of, of going from childhood to adulthood. He was like 16 and we went down there, I visited um, I visited Columbia. I got to know her family and stuff. We went around to the different churches. And uh, I, met, I met this kid, this one kid in particular. His name was Oscar. And I'll just, I'll use the English. Maybe it makes it a little bit easier. But, his, we, you know, Oscar. And we, we, I met him. And he's, he was a great kid. He was just like a youth group kid. He, he played worship, played guitar in the worship team. He was just learning guitar. He loved the cameras and stuff. So he was always, like, messing with the camera and all, all these different things. He was a really cool kid. And I had a chance to spend some time with him when we were down there. We lived there for, like, six months. And then we moved back to the United States. And so we moved back to the, to the U.S. And we found out a couple months later that, that Oscar had, had gotten, you know, he's been sick. And he was, like, 17 years old at the time. And, and you know, we're, we're praying and we're saying, okay, God, like, you know, he's in your hands and, and it's not kind of a big deal. And, and as months go by, you know, we would hear like little reports here and there like, oh, you know, he's still sick. Oh, he's still sick. And, and he's, he's not really doing well. And, and oh, they, 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 found, they, they found cancer in this young boy's leg. And they're like, oh, we're going to put him through treatments. And then the treatments don't work. And this is like months of this. And my wife was, was this, this little boy's children's pastor for many years, loved this kid. So, so he's going through this. We're in the United States. He's going through this back in Colombia. And it's over months and months. And he's still playing guitar. And he's still praising God. And, and he's going through this, this situation. And eventually, eventually what was in his leg, they, they had to take his leg. So they took off his leg. And he's 17 years old. And he has one leg. And he's, and he's still playing guitar in the worship team. And he's still praising God with his life that he has. He's still using his breath to lift up the name of Jesus. And as the months go by and the, and the sickness is getting worse and he's getting skinnier and he's playing guitar on one leg, they had this thing where he graduated high school. And right, not too long after he graduated high school, there was like a, a, a church, like it was a several church-wide youth event. And Oscar was playing guitar and he was going through this difficult time and he was playing guitar and all of his friends from high school came to see him at this Christian event. These were not Christians. He did not go to a Christian high school. But they came to see him, to support him, and they came, and the place was full of youth that came to witness this kid who was, at this point, on his way out, skinny, sucked up, missing a leg, on stage, playing guitar, praising the Lord. And I remember writing to him, you know, we weren't, we weren't in Colombia, but I was writing to him on, on social media and stuff and trying to encourage him. And we were praying for him and everybody down there is praying for him. And all of these people, all of these like high school friends of his, all of these people, he kind of became this thing where people knew that this guy was going through some terrible suffering, but he was still praising God and it drew a crowd to him. So much so that people were getting saved by being around and hearing his testimony. And when he passed, all of these kids and all of these adults and all of these people who had watched this happen, it was, it was like, 
It was like if it's the middle of the night and it's completely dark and there's not a star in the sky and you're standing outside with a bunch of people and it's dark, 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 and then a shooting star streaks across the sky and it illuminates everybody just for a moment and then it's gone. And then after it's over, you're just looking at each other like, did you see that? Did you see that? Did you see that? Because everyone had seen the life of this kid who had every excuse in the world to curse God and die giving his last breaths to the Lord Jesus and saying, no matter what happens, God, I know that you're good. I'm going to sing, I'm going to play guitar, and I'm going to lift up the name of Jesus because I know my hope is firmly rooted on the rock that will never let me down. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, the shadow of death. I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they come for me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies, even if that enemy is death. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The grace of God is always there. The light of Christ is always penetrating even into the deepest darkness of the suffering and the trials, the dungeons, the prisons. That's why Paul can say what he says about trials and sufferings. He says it in 2 Corinthians. We're going to go fast. He says, I have worked much harder, Paul says. This. I've been in prison more frequently. I've been flogged more severely. I've been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one, 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I've spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, from the Gentiles, in the city, in the country, in the sea, from false believers. He just goes on, verse 27, I've labored and toiled. I've often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. Paul says, I've been cold and naked. And that same guy says, I am convinced that neither death nor life, not angels or demons, not the present or the future, nor any powers, height, depth, anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Not blindness, not deafness, not speech impediments, not divorce. God hates divorce. He don't hate you. Not a heart murmur, not a sick child, not emphysema, not cancer, not high blood pressure, not what your uncle did to you, not what this woman tried to do to you, not those careless words your parents spoke over your life. You'll always be a loser. You'll never be nothing. You're just like your mother. You're just like your father. You're stupid. You're ugly. You'll never amount to anything. We've all experienced different things like this, and it's nothing, nothing, nothing. can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Will you receive that offer of hope today? Just because things went bad for you doesn't mean that God's mad at you. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love and his mercy endure forever. He is good. Sin is bad. And if you never have received the Lord, if you've never received that offer of salvation, that offer of forgiveness, that offer of eternal life, I encourage you. You've got to do that before it's too late. And if you're in a season right now, a season of suffering and difficulty, trust him, praise him anyway. I know it's not easy. He knows. Trust your life back into the hands of the one who created you, the hands who knit you together in your mother's womb. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I just thank you, God, for who you are, for your grace and your power and your strength, Lord. 
for your light even in the darkest of places, Lord, for your spirit in the deepest of trials and sufferings, Lord. Teach us, Lord, help us to look to you and to find your joy in the difficult times, God, to find our, your peace, Lord, when life is crazy, God, to find you at the center of everything and have our hope and our trust in you, God, forever, because we know, Lord, that you will never let us down. 